We made last week the transition to chapters 9, 10, and 11, which is a very distinct major section in Romans. Chapters 1 through 8 involved a, a lengthy, detailed, glorious explanation of the gospel in all of its facets. Now, chapters 9, 10, and 11 are focusing on the relationship between Israel and the church. That's what these chapters are all about. There's a lot of great verses in there. There's a lot of verses that often get plucked out of context for various reasons. And that doesn't mean that they're wrong, but it's good for us to know why they're there. And this chapter in particular, Romans 9, is famous for its discussion of predestination and election, which are touchy subjects. In case you are unaware, if you haven't been around the church for a while, these are the kind of things that, you know, predestination, election, sovereignty, those, them's fighting words in the church. And, uh, you know, Calvary Chapel, let me explain to you the way that we do this. Not just this church here, but as an association. We are committed, as you know, to the verse-by-verse -verse teaching of the Word, which gives us, as we study, a very natural biblical theology. What systematic theology can do, and there are great advantages to it, I'm not putting it down, is it can cause you to become imbalanced, and you give one section of Scripture greater weight than another. Now, that can be appropriate, but in other cases it cannot be. But what this does for us is as we teach through it, it's hard for us to hold to a hard and fast rigid system of a certain doctrine because very quickly you'll run into one of these passages that doesn't fit very neatly into that system. So as Calvary Chapel, we are not Calvinists, we are not Arminians, and I don't think that's news to anybody here. So as we go through this, as we do with any subject, we're going to study it in context. We're going to look at these verses that are used to sometimes batter people over the head in the context it was written. This doesn't mean that we're going to come to a different conclusion necessarily, but it will help us understand why it was written. And what we're going to do today, we're going to cover verse 6 through 18, and we're going to look at this subject in context. I'm going to preach a message that takes the lessons that are being preached and preaches them the way Paul does. A lot of the things he says will raise some very interesting questions and maybe confuse some of you if you've not studied this in detail before. Next week, we're going to grab that bull by the horns and we're going to see if we can't wrestle it to the ground and come to a, a, a fair, balanced statement of, of what we believe about this. But, you know, if, if you are already firmly in one of these camps or the other, you're probably going to remain disappointed. Uh, but that's okay because I think we need to let the scripture speak for itself. And there are some things that the Bible says incredibly plainly, and we know exactly what it means. There are other things it says in a mysterious way, and we've got to hold it loosely. Then there's other times where the Bible says two things very plainly that seem to run counter to one another. We're not quite sure how they fit together. And that's when we need to hold our understanding of the balance of those things loosely in one hand. And that is what we are going to try to do. So today is not going to be the let's sit down and talk about predestination message. That's coming next week. But today we're going to look at this, this same subject in context, and I will remind all of us, regardless of where you land on this, we cannot let our discomfort with half of the lesson the Bible teaches, meaning the sovereignty of God, the will of man, wh whichever side you feel less comfortable with, you cannot let that prevent you from learning the lesson that is trying to be taught through those teachings. And I think when you read it in context, these be things become less scary and less threatening. And there is, there is no one passage of Scripture that is going to demolish another passage of Scripture unless it comes out very plainly. Because sometimes you get into like trading verses and it's like, well, I've got four and you've got three, therefore I win. Well, no, God only needs to say something once for it to be true. So hopefully this will be instructive, not just on this lesson, but on how we are to go about what's called biblical theology and... Let's begin. Let's look at verses 6 through 8 of Romans chapter 9. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring, but through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. Paul opens this paragraph with the word, but, because the last thing he said in the first five verses, as we looked at last week, was his lament over the Jewish people, over the nation of Israel. The fact that they were not as a whole receiving Jesus as their Messiah. Now, Paul saying that might imply, if he wasn't careful, that 
God's promises, his wonderful promises that he'd made throughout the old covenant had failed. That God had promised Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and David and Zechariah all these wonderful things. And then Jesus comes and none of it happened. And Paul wants to very quickly get in there and say, that's not true. And in fact, you might want to underline verse 8 or verse 6 because that is, in a sense, the whole point of Romans 9, 10, and 11. It is not as though the word of God has failed, meaning God's promises to Israel, his promises of blessing, of prosperity, of descendants, of land. These promises have not failed. And he's going to, through chapter 9, 10, and 11, give multiple reasons why that is, and we're going to look at the first one here today. Because you might think that, that most Jews had, and in fact have to this day, rejected Messiah Jesus. Many will tell you, Zach can tell you, he's done some ministry over in Israel. Preaching the gospel to a Jewish person is a very difficult prospect. And some of that's on us, what the church has done historically. But let's look at what Paul says here. We, we can go ahead and start with the conclusion. God's promises have not failed. Well, what's, what gives then? Paul's first point is that God has reserved a remnant for himself in the land of Israel as he always has. This is kind of his point here is that it's never been everyone from from the very beginning. It's never been everybody that belonged to the nation of Israel has participated and received the blessings of Israel. And I want to make a quick note here. We will get onto this in great detail in chapter 11. Paul is not here making the point that national Israel means nothing and that the Gentile church has overtaken them. He'll say that explicitly in chapter 11. Right now, we, we, this is an in-house discussion of the Jewish people and Jewish Christians especially. I'm just going to make that note and then we'll move on. So his point is that to be a descendant of Israel does not mean that you belong to Israel, meaning its spiritual blessings and, and everything that God had planned for them. And you say, well, how can you say something like that, Paul? He's got a lot of scripture references to back this up. He starts with Genesis 21, verse 12. If you're taking notes, verse 7, he's quoting from Genesis 21, 12. When he says, through Isaac shall your offspring be named, or through Isaac shall your seed be called. This story, you remember, not Abraham's finest hour, was when he and his wife Sarah had decided, look, God promised we were going to have a son. But if you read the story, Sarah was past the age of having children. It was no longer biologically possible for her to have children. Therefore, they concluded God must have meant that we were going to have a child some other way. So they take her slave girl, Hagar, as a surrogate mother, and Abraham fathers a child with her, and his name was Ishmael. And this young man grows up being raised as Abraham's heir. But then the Lord tells him in chapter 21, when Sarah's going to have a baby, he says, it's Isaac not Ishmael. Through Isaac shall your seed be called. What is the point Paul is making here? His point is just being part of the chosen family is not enough to inherit all that God has promised. Ishmael was a descendant of Abraham, but he did not receive the covenant blessings of the sons of Abraham, even though he was one. There's plenty of blessings that go along with them. You know, we we say things about the Arabian people and and we wish God would do something about them, God has deliberately chosen to bless them because they are in large part descendants of Abraham. But they are not participants in the covenant, you understand. This is Paul's point. They say, well, only a few Jews are getting saved. God's promises has failed. And Paul goes, well, it's never been enough just to be part of the family. Look at Ishmael. He's part of the family. And it was Isaac. This is similar to what John the Baptist said in Luke chapter 3. And this is one of my favorite verses because you get a a sense of the kind of man that God likes to use. John the Baptist was, of course, baptizing people in the river. He was a crazy, wild man. His hair had never been cut, and he lived in the desert, so it was nappy and dreadlocks and everything else. And here come the Pharisees and Sadducees, and he calls them out. He calls their mamas a bunch of snakes, and he says in verse 8 of Luke 3, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. He says, I'll baptize you. I believe you're serious. And then he says, and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. How dare you tell us we can't be baptized for forgiveness. We're Abraham's descendants. And John the Baptist says, God could turn that rock into a child of Abraham. And we've already seen this point made in Romans chapter 2 as well, haven't we? 
He said that it's not enough just to have the law. It's not enough just to know the promises. If you don't keep the law, then it's of no value to you. And in fact, a Gentile who follows his conscience is better off than a Jew who doesn't follow the law. And he eventually would get around to the point that Gentiles don't follow their consciences either, and we're all under wrath. But the point he was making is that salvation is by grace through faith alone. And that's the same point he's making here. As Paul phrases it, salvation is through God's promise. Look at verse 8. It is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. Ishmael was a child of the flesh, just as Isaac was, but Isaac was also a child of the promise. And that's what makes the difference. The reception of the gospel is never automatic for anybody. That's, that's the key point that we got to grasp from this here. Therefore, the fact that most Jews have not to this day received their Messiah is not evidence that God's promises to them have failed. So I might add as a side note, if you're going to point to the fact that the nation of Israel today, the Jewish people today, very strongly and vehemently reject Jesus, that's not evidence that God has done with them. Paul explicitly tells us that doesn't count. Because it's the promise that matters, not how people act. Salvation is owed to nobody. Your works do not cause God to owe you salvation. The wages of sin is death. If you want to get what you deserve, you get death. But the free gift of God is eternal life. So it doesn't matter how many great things you've done. If you do not repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will not be saved. Your association does not cause God to owe salvation to you. But I go to church. Don't you know? Don't you know who my parents are? Don't you know who my family is? Don't you know who my pastor is and the books that I read? Don't you know the denomination I belong to? Don't you know the political party I vote for? God, I'm I'm one of the good guys. He doesn't owe you a thing. And it's certainly not by your bloodline. By Isaac shall your seed, your offspring be called. So Paul says, even though there are many descendants of Abraham, there are only a few that are those spiritual sons and daughters of Abraham. So it doesn't matter what your daddy did, what your grandma did. It doesn't matter. That's not enough to save you. Paul's expectations regarding who would be saved had been disrupted by the gospel of grace through faith. So let's apply this to our own lives. And this is the point that I really wanted to explore today. And this is why I've put off discussing the doctrine itself, because I think this is important. If you, 10 years ago, were to look around whatever church you were attending, wasn't this one because we didn't exist yet, you were to make a list of everybody in that church, and you were to make a list of two categories. Who will go the distance and really stick with it, and who's going to fall away? And you were to check that list now, You'd be pretty surprised, wouldn't you? I think the coronavirus pandemic showed us, without any kind of varnish or kindness, who was really following the Lord at that time. You look at people and you would think, oh, that guy, he's going all the way. Look at how on fire he is for Jesus. And then five years later, you have no idea where he is. Meanwhile, that, that lady is always causing trouble. He's always trying to start something new. She's here every week, and every time she walks in the door, I just kind of groan a little bit. I know I shouldn't, but I do. And then 20 years later, there she is, still walking with Jesus. Isn't this true? If you were to look at your friends, maybe even the person that led you to Jesus has walked away from the Lord, and here you are. You you are the person that barely got saved. You're like, I only got saved because they were, and I kind of did it because that was the thing to do, and yet I'm still walking with Jesus, and all the people that had the heart right, so to speak, are gone. I'll tell you, some of the finest Christians I've ever known have failed, while some of the long shots are still going strong. Haven't you found that to be true? Praise the Lord, because I think some of us are certainly in that category. You know what? I've had had people come forward to be saved, and we rejoice because it's a radical, amazing, we've been praying for this, thank you, Lord, and then a few years later, it just kind of fizzles and they're gone. Meanwhile, somebody comes forward to be saved, and you're like, okay, look, we'll pray together, but I kind of know what you're like. And we'll see how this goes. And after a while, you're like, you want to be a missionary? I, yeah, I, I guess you kind of have grown up a little bit, haven't you? This is what I'll call today the mystery of the elect. That's a phrase the Bible uses, the elect, the chosen ones. We do not know who is going to remain until that final day, do we? And we can at least know that from our own experience. 
even great men of God, pastors that have led countless people to salvation will crash and burn. And sometimes they repent, but quite often they don't. And then there are scoundrels and rascals like Paul, persecutors of the church. And yet God says, I'm going to take him and I'm going to turn him into an apostle. The mystery of the elect. We do not fully understand who's going to be there on that last day. Jesus understood this. Will you turn with me to Matthew 13? It's a longish passage, so I want us to read it together. Matthew 13. Jesus actually has several parables in this passage teaching this same lesson. Matthew 13, verses 24 through 30. We're talking about the fact that very often our expectations over who will be saved and who will last forever are thwarted by time. Matthew 13, and we're going to read verses 24 through 30. He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds, or tares, you probably remember it that way, among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time I will tell the reapers, Gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn." So the parable of the wheat and the weeds, or the wheat and the tares, as I think most of us learned it. It illustrates the fact that in God's church, there are growing up those who will be saved and those who will not. Those who are true believers and those that are hypocrites and fakers. Those that have the ability to endure to the end and those who will not. And that in this life, it is just about impossible to tell who is who. We look around and wheat, tares, weeds... And it's hard for us. Sometimes we think we do. And sometimes you can. Sometimes you need to get that weed out of there. That's what we call church discipline. Other times you are sure and confident that that person is going to bear good fruit forever. And on that final day, the Lord's going to go, depart from me. I never knew you. It's a sobering thought to consider, isn't it? You must remember that salvation is by faith alone. It's not by works, even good works, especially good works the things that you do for the church. It's not by your prominence in the church. We're children of Abraham. You might say, well, we're children of the Protestant Reformation. We're descendants theologically of Luther and Calvin, or we're descendants of Wesley and Whitfield and that revival. We're descendants of Chuck Smith and the Jesus movement. We're part of that tradition. Yes, you are, but it's not enough to save you. It doesn't matter what you've done for the Lord. If you don't repent and believe, you will not be saved. And you cannot know a man's heart. And I'm not trying to get on us by saying we ought to know who's who. No, we can only judge by what we see, right? Jesus didn't tell us, dig into somebody's heart and figure out what's going on there. He said, judge them by their what? Fruit. And very often you look at somebody's life and it looks great, looks fine. They're in the church, they're there, they're participating, they're giving, they're even teaching maybe. Until sometimes you hit a difficulty and it turns out that this person was stony soil. They had no roots, and it didn't go deep. And when hard times came, the sun scorched it. I think we saw that during the pandemic. Many, and I think this church was largely spared from that. We, we, most of us are still here. And I'm not talking about those that are home because they have some kind of illness or some kind of sickness. I'm leaving that aside. I'm talking about those that saw their chance to get out and left and are never coming back. Con countless churches, y'all, have just shriveled up and died. Not because these people all of a sudden decided, I hate God, I don't want anything to do with them. It's because they had no root to begin with. And when they weren't getting that constant supply in the church, that constant social acceptance in the church, they didn't see their need for it anymore. Also, severe temptation can do this and reveal somebody to be thorny soil. You know, sometimes people are good because they don't have any opportunity to do the wrong thing. Somebody wins the lottery and they're gone. Somebody find, some people come into church, they're only looking for, to fulfill a need that is not the God-shaped hole in their heart. They're looking to find friends, and if they find good friends elsewhere, they're gone. They're looking to find somebody to, 
to love and they find a boyfriend or girlfriend, doesn't matter if they're Christian or not, and they're gone because that's all I really needed from this place. That's Mark chapter 4, by the way, this, the parable of the soil and the seeds. Not everyone who goes to church will be saved. Not everybody who prayed a prayer and said, Lord Jesus, come into my heart, will be saved. Not everybody who went on a missions trip will be saved or served in a ministry or preached from the pulpit will be saved. Only those whose faith endures and is tested by life and by death. And I'm not trying to cast doubt on anyone's salvation, although Paul does say, examine yourself. Test yourself to see whether you truly are in the faith. God provides no assurance of salvation for those who do not persist in faithful obedience. Abide in Christ, Jesus said. Every branch of me that does not abide is taken out and burned. So Paul looks at the nation of Israel and he says, I cannot believe that so few of them have believed. But then he goes, but I should have known because it's not being part of Israel that saves anybody. It's only being part of the promise. And this has always been the case. He'll give another illustration in verse 9. For this is what the promise said. About this time next year, I will return and Sarah shall have a son. Not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. So here he gives further illustration from the Old Testament of the point he's trying to make. He started with Ishmael and Isaac. Child of the flesh, child of the promise. Now he uses the example of Jacob and Esau. He begins by quoting from Genesis 18.10. So if you're taking notes, that's verse 9. That's what he's quoting from, Genesis 18.10. This is when the three men came to Abraham's tent, do you remember? And he said, about this time, Sarah will have a son. And she was listening at the tent, and she laughed, remember? Why did Sarah laugh? I didn't laugh. Yeah, you did. And so they named the child Isaac, which means laughter, right? That's that story. And then the next quote there, which is verse 12, the older will serve the younger, comes from Genesis 25, 23. This is when Rebecca had been trying to have a child for 20 years. Finally, the Lord grants her to have a child, but she's in distress during her pregnancy. Some of y'all know what that's all about. But she goes to the Lord and she inquires of the Lord, what's going on? And God tells her, you're having twins. And he says, not only that, but there are two nations in your womb. He says, the older shall serve the younger. He tells her right there, your firstborn son is not going to be the one who receives my promise, but the youngest son, not Esau, but Jacob. So he, he uses this illustration twice, that this children that would be born, it, they both were equally of the flesh, but only one received the promise. He emphasizes that they were twins. They were children of one man. And in fact, because they were twins, you couldn't say that there was anything different about their conception or their delivery or anything. They were equal. And he also points out that they had done nothing, either good or bad. That right there tells you that God is not looking into the future and seeing which one is going to serve him. In fact, remember, God has to pin Jacob down and rip his hip out of socket to make him do the right thing. Neither one of them was a good person. He says, the Lord chose Jacob. Why? Because he could. They were born equally. The less obvious candidate was chosen. Why? Because God is stepping in and he's saying, this is because of me, not because of them. Nobody inherits my promise. Well, he's the oldest son. He receives it. God goes, no, first chance I get, I'm going to pick the one you wouldn't expect. To remind you that the purpose of election might continue to assert authority over his promises. Now, aren't you glad about that? That we're, we're not stuck following the laws of men to determine who's going to be saved? Not, and there's no aristocrats in here. None of us are going to inherit anything. We're not, we're not going to be the lords and the ladies of the land who receive God's salvation. At least I'm speaking for myself anyhow. It's a good thing for me that God is the one who saves. And it's not, well, the oldest son will receive most of the blessing and then the youngest will receive some of it and it'll, it'll scale down. Paul's point here is that salvation is not by works. It cannot be earned or inherited. He quotes finally there in verse 13 from Malachi chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. If you've read the, the prophet Malachi, it's, it's a lot of rhetorical questions. He comes in and he says, 
or not rhetorical questions, but it's a question and answer format. He says, you, you know, the people say, God, you haven't loved us. And God goes, I haven't loved you. I chose Jacob and not Esau. I love Jacob and I hated Esau. We go, oh, hate, God, hate, just take it easy, all right? The point he's saying is that I chose Jacob to be a mighty nation, to save the world, to be the, a nation that will endure forever. His capital city will be my heavenly city. My Messiah will be born from his line. And Esau, just like everybody else, Edomites. Jacob I have loved and Esau I have hated. He's describing favor as opposed to Esau. He's telling us God chose Jacob freely. God didn't ex examine which one was good and pick one. He chose freely. And you look at the story, I mean, he, he didn't make a great choice from our perspective. Jacob was a liar. He was a sneak. He was a manipulator. He was a backdoor dealer. He was easily intimidated and pushed around. His wives got the better of him often. His children got the better of him often. And even at the end of his life, it doesn't come off very great. His relationship with God is solid, but he's just kind of weeping and moaning about everything, right? He finds out that his other sons have been taken hostage in Egypt by Joseph. He doesn't know that, but he says, all these things are against me. My dad loves to say that around the house. Anytime something happens, he drops something on the floor. All these things are against me. And then he gets he's reunited with his son. He's brought before Pharaoh, you know, the king of the world, to meet Jacob. And he, he talks to him and he says, short and difficult have been the years of my sojourning, and they have not attained to the years of my father. Pharaoh's like, okay, old man, all right, nice to meet you too. So this is God's man? This is the one that God picked? Yeah. Why? Because God says, because it depends on me, not him. And that's good for me, because if it depended on me, I wouldn't be in much better shape. And even if you think, well, I'm much better than Jacob, well, now you've got a pride problem, and you're right back where you started. Jesus said in John 15, 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you. Now look back on your salvation. Can't you say that that was true? Like God came and got me. Like I, I believed in the moment. I walked down the aisle. And at that time, I thought that I was doing a lot of soul searching. And I thought that I was. And then once I got saved, I realized, oh, that was all Jesus. We all know that to be true. No one, by birth or circumstance or works, can deserve God's grace. The only person that deserved God's favor was the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And he willingly gave that up so that he could offer it to us freely. Salvation has only ever been by the mercy of God. Mercy. You remember your VBS definition of mercy? Not getting what you deserve. I want what I deserve. Are you sure about that? Because we're all under the wrath of God. I want justice. Uh, not really. What you want is mercy. What you want is kindness and compassion. So because of that, those who are saved are those that God has chosen to show mercy to. Those who have been chosen to be saved. The purpose of election. And this is a profound mystery. And anybody who claims to understand all of it needs to think about it a little longer. When you begin to look at things in life or in the Bible from God's perspective, your head starts to swim a little bit, doesn't it? But how can that, what, I, but I, that doesn't make any sense. Well, that's why the Lord says, my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And we begin to think things like, well, wait a minute. So does God choose some people and then not others? And then how does that work? Think of it this way. This, this really helps me. The only way that God could make salvation available freely to everybody, so not by pedigree, not by family, not by rank or by money, he wants to make salvation available to everybody, all right? He also can't violate his justice and, and save everybody and overlook their sins. He can't do that because sin must be judged. So the only way he could do those things was to make faith the means of forgiveness. I'll make it a gift that they receive by faith. That way, anybody can receive it, and those who don't believe will receive my justice. And those that believe, my justice has been poured out on Jesus Christ. However, not everyone is going to have faith like that. There are some, like Naaman, who say, you tell me to do some crazy thing, and I'll do it for Jesus. Or you tell me all I've got to do is believe, and they get offended by the thought of it being so simple. 
That's why it's so hard to watch certain intellectuals wrestle with the gospel because you know their problem is they can't let go of their pride. It can't be that simple. I have four PhDs. I'm a, I'm a kajillionaire. You can't tell me that I'm going to get saved the same way as this bum on the street. That's why Jesus said, unless you can become like a little child, you'll by no means receive the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, those who are chosen are the ones who will believe. Ephesians 1.11 says, In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Our expectations of who will endure to the end are often thwarted because we think according to the flesh. Look at how much that, that person's tithing. Look at how much they're serving. Look at how much they cry during worship. They must truly be saved. The Lord looks at them and he says, no, their heart is far from me. But God has gr taken great pains to show us that salvation is only available through faith, which is good because that means it does not matter what you do or do not have going for you as a person in order to be saved. There are people sitting on death row right now that could be just as easily saved as anybody in this room. Any valedictorian that graduates from any of these high schools can be saved just as easily as some destitute person living on the, the plains of Africa. There's no distinction with God. So that's why when we look at our salvation, it's, it's odd. When, when people are getting saved, we know this. But then we evaluate the rest of their lives according to the flesh, which isn't good. Salvation is in God's hands, not ours. And very often, he surprises us with his methods, doesn't he? Verses 14 through 18. What shall we say then? And he's going to answer your immediate question. Is there injustice on God's part? Meaning, is that fair? By no means. So there's your answer. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So that depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. Now we hear that, God choosing people to be saved, Although there's no other way to be saved because we can't do anything to earn it. It can only be that way. But we cry foul because it doesn't seem fair for us for God to save one person and not another. And the thing is, that's probably not why they were upset about it. We're upset because we say God should save everybody. They were upset because they're saying, how dare God save everybody? I'm a child of Abraham. Don't you know who I am? God owes me something. I've read that Old Testament. I made my sacrifices. I've been circumcised and taught my children the law. How dare the Lord say none of that counts for anything? They were indignant that their flesh counted for nothing. But right away, let's just, anytime we're having a discussion about these things, like Paul says, you've got to dispense with the idea that God is unfair. Because God is good. You only know what good is because of God. You only know what fair is because of God. And if we really want to talk about what's fair Every man, woman, and child going to hell is what's fair. So let's just slow our roll on that. It's okay to be a little confused and seek to understand. But as we're going to read next week, don't you dare stick your finger in God's face and say, you can't do it that way. We'll return to that next week. But Paul quotes in verse 15, a lot of quotations in this passage. Can you tell? Verse 15, he's quoting from Exodus 33, 19. This is when Moses is interceding for the Hebrews at Mount Sinai. And the Lord says, I will show mercy to whom I will have mercy. He's saying, I hear your prayers, Moses. I'm going to do what you ask, but you need to remember, it's not because you're such a great man that I'm doing this for you. It's my mercy and my compassion. He's emphasizing that God is entirely independent. And we know that, don't we? God is not somehow tied up by his people. Sometimes we even think that way when it comes to prayer. We'll say, Lord, if we praise and if we pray, you have no choice. No, take it easy. God can do whatever he pleases. He only answers our prayers by his grace. And that's not to say you should not press your prayers strongly, but it means you, you keep in the back of your mind, God will have mercy on whom he has mercy. And verse 16 nicely sums it up, right? It is based not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. What's it? Well, I think there's a couple things in context. First of all, salvation doesn't depend on human will or exertion. Haven't you found that to be true? You were saved when you finally gave up and stopped striving. Lord, it's just got to be you. It's all the Lord. But also the Lord's purposes. If God's going to work something out, he uses men, but he's the one making it happen. 
It's not up to us, but up to God, which is good, because if it was up to you, you wouldn't get anywhere. Every one of us is under wrath to begin with. And it's important for us to keep this fact in our mind. For God to show mercy to anybody is kindness. It's gravy. It's extra. And for God to send anybody to hell is perfect justice. So however God chooses to deal with anybody is in his goodness. And then he quotes from Exodus 9.16. In verse 17 there, he's quoting from Exodus 9.16. This is right before the seventh plague, the plague of hail, where Moses stands before Pharaoh again, and what does he say? Let my people go. He's telling them, this is why you're king, Pharaoh. He's essentially pleading with them and saying, God has raised you up to show his glory to the whole world and his faithfulness to his people. And so far we've gone through six terrible plagues and you haven't budged. Why not now show mercy to the people and give glory to God and fulfill the purpose for which you were created? But of course, Pharaoh refused and God got what he wanted from Pharaoh anyway. God raised up Pharaoh so that he could demonstrate to the whole world that Pharaoh's gods and therefore anyone else's gods are useless and to show his love and his liberating power for his people. That was the purpose of the Exodus. It's remarkable to think about this, that God, in order to assert himself on the world stage, told an incredible story. He didn't just say, I'm your God, now you come worship me. He told the incredible story of slavery and the ten plagues and the Red Sea and Mount Sinai. Even people that don't believe the Bible love that story. Because God was stamping his goodness on the world. And he says, that's why I raised you up, Pharaoh. That's why you're here now. God always has a purpose. Remember in John chapter 9, they saw the blind man. And the disciples, in their infinite kindness, said, Jesus, whose fault is this? Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus looked at them and he said, nobody sinned. He was born blind so that I could show the glory of God. And he opened the eyes of the blind man. God always has a reason for what he's doing. And Pharaoh is the illustration that the Holy Spirit chose through Paul to illustrate this, which tells us something. It means that you can go look at the example of Pharaoh and get a sense of how this works out. Because as I said, we'll talk about this more next week. You can start to get into this, this view of, of, of God jerking people around by the scruff of the neck. And that is not how scripture reveals it to us. You look at the story of Pharaoh. Pharaoh was given every chance to do the right thing. He was told, sort of told to his face, God wants to let these people go. He's using you to do it. And if you don't, he's going to send 10 plagues. And he said, no. And then he did it again and again. Pharaoh hardened his heart. He hardened his heart. He hardened his heart. And then ultimately, what does it say? God hardened Pharaoh's heart. So you can dispense with the idea of God wrenching salvation away from willing participants. Because what we tend to think when we read about election and predestination, but what if there are people that would be saved and God says no? That's not how it works, friends. Don't, don't, don't have, have pity on Pharaoh. He was a tyrannical dictator that had enslaved an entire nation of people and allowed his people to go through the worst devastation economically and, and even physically. You know, we, we had the, the virus and that was bad. Imagine if it was boils and it was everybody. Not only that, but there's dead frogs everywhere and you can't drink the water because it's made of blood now and all your animals are dying and then there's hailstones that catch on fire. Pharaoh was not a good person. So God is absolutely just in judging him. But then we think, but what about my friends? What about my kids? My parents? The hard truth is to know that they all fall in those same categories. God is not forcing somebody in a direction that they would not otherwise go. In fact, he gave Pharaoh chance after chance after chance. Even when, for example, King Ahab, God was going to judge King Ahab. And Ahab deserved it. So what happens is God sent a lying spirit into all of Ahab's prophets to induce him to go to the battle where God would have him killed. But you know what God also did? He sent Micaiah to go and tell him that all the prophets were lying. Don't listen to any of them. God's trying to get you dead. You can either repent or you can go to battle and you can die. And of course, Ahab went to battle, thought he'd trick God by dressing up like a common soldier instead of the king. And it says an arrow at random, meaning an angel-directed arrow, struck him and he died on the battlefield. So it was God 
being sovereign and exercising his power there? Yeah, but he also let Ahab know exactly what was going on. So we say, well, it's not fair that God doesn't save people. Hey, if there is somebody that is not going to be saved in the final day, if they've heard the gospel, is God not just in executing his wrath upon them? God is sovereign. The thing is, we see people in the middle of their story. And we're often surprised by what happens next because we regard them according to the flesh. And what we need to realize is sometimes God will allow a person to be raised up for a time for a purpose, even though God knows their heart and he knows they're never ultimately going to believe. Sometimes God raises up men to save their families, even though he himself in the end will fall away. And it's heartbreaking, but if you think about it, God goes, I, I allowed this man to be part of the church for this long, even though I knew what his heart was like, and I knew he would never endure because I knew his kids would. That's God's purposes. Sometimes people are raised up to spur the church on to greater heights that that man himself will never reach. People come into the church, and they're fiery, and they're blazing, and they're telling everybody, we got to do this, we got to read our Bibles, we got to get out. And the sleepy church awakes and says, yes, and begins to do it. Meanwhile, that person falls away. That's a great example in the, in the Jesus movement. There was a man named Lonnie Frisbee. He was, a, he was a hippie that came alongside Pastor Chuck and began to lead this revival together. And Pastor Chuck endured with Jesus to the very end. Lonnie Frisbee, hardly anybody knows his name anymore. He fell away and and went back to his sinful lifestyle and, and died in agony. And you say, well, that's just not fair. God goes, this guy's never going to be saved, but you know what I can use him for? I can use him to wake up my church. Perhaps people have been raised up to give blessings to the church that they'll never enjoy. How many people have written amazing, beautiful songs for the church that we love and are ministered to, and then they walk away or they fall away from the Lord? Even Bible teachers and pastors that lead countless people to salvation and give us new, new weapons in our arsenal to defend the gospel, and then they fall away. Is all of that invalid now? No. God raised them up for that purpose, even though they themselves were not saved. In John chapter 2, verses 23 through 25, it says, When Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them, because he knew all men and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. Jesus was preaching and doing miracles, and he had multitudes coming to him and saying, We'll follow you, Jesus. You're the Messiah. We're going to come after you. It says, Jesus did not commit himself to them. I mean, he knew. He knew what was up. He knew they were coming at him because they had political and, and national designs that they wanted to use him for. Because they were looking for him to feel good about their sin, although they had no intention of ever actually repenting of it. He knew that they had no roots and that they would never last. So Jesus, in many cases, it seems, kept people at a distance because he knew what was up. Salvation is not going to be complete until that day when we stand in God's presence and our names are read from the book of life. And Matthew 7.22 tells us that many will be shocked on that day. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will inherit the kingdom of heaven. Not everybody that attaches themselves in the flesh to the people of God will be saved, but only those that believe. And they'll say, Lord, what about you skipped me? What, don't you know I was a preacher? I tithe, don't you know that? And they begin to rattle off all the things they did in the flesh for the Lord. None of it says, Lord, I throw myself upon the mercy of Jesus Christ and his blood. They're listing off the things they've done. Even some of the miracles that God permitted them to do, that he might bless somebody else. But in the end, the Lord points his finger and says, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. It's a sobering thought, isn't it? The wheat and the tares are just about indistinguishable in this life. But we must know that this is the case. We must know that it is the elect that will be saved on that day. And for us now, can I just tell you, do not spend your tr time trying to identify who's wheat and who's not. Jesus said in the parable not to do that. You're going to hurt people. You're going to falsely call somebody out. You, you, it's not like you're sitting there peering into their heart. You're evaluating the flesh. You're evaluating the things they do or the way they dress or the things they say or the friends that they have that you wouldn't have. Don't do that. In fact, the people that, that do that are often very insecure in their own salvation and the way they feel better about themselves is finding people to shake their finger at. 
But if that's not how we respond, how should we respond to this knowledge? Which is a hard thing to accept and consider. And everything in me wants to run the other way and minimize and balance this doctrine. But I can't do that. Because Paul said it right there. He has mercy on whomever he wills and he hardens whomever he wills. But let me give you seven points of application that you can take home with you, knowing that this is true. Number one, you've got to press on. The Bible urges you to grab hold of salvation, do everything you can to grab it, and never let it go. But I thought it was up to God. Yeah, but the Lord told us what? Press on, grab it. Paul in Philippians chapter 3 says, I have counted everything as loss that I might take hold of Christ, that by any means I might attain the resurrection from the dead. Paul says, if anybody is going to be saved, then by golly, it's going to be me. I'm going to do everything I can to grab hold of it. If your doctrine of predestination tells you just to relax because you can't do anything about it, you're wrong. Press on. If you say, well, I'm scared to death that I might be a tear, then be wheat. Live like wheat. Get your heart right with the Lord. Press on and do everything you can to attain that resurrection. Number two, admonish one another. Get your friends around you to press on. Don't let your brothers and sisters in Christ go down without a fight. If you see them drifting, like Jude says, snatch them out of the fire. Don't let your brothers and sisters wander. Proverbs 11.30 says, he who saves souls is wise. If you see somebody wandering off into sin, you've got to get over yourself and call the person out in love and in kindness and with tears in your eyes to keep them from wandering away. Because who knows if that might not be exactly what God is trying to do to bring them back from the edge. Number three, you've got to think spiritually. That's kind of been the whole point today, right? Is Paul's like, we can't evaluate Israel according to the flesh because it's according to the promise, not the flesh. So we ourselves need to set our priorities on what is eternal, not on flashy, fleshly stuff. Both for ourselves Right? Don't spend all your time trying to do a bunch of things, as good as they are. The first thing is that your heart is right with the Lord and that you have that thriving, abiding relationship with Jesus Christ. Do you know God? That's what Jesus said eternal life was, that they may know you and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. It also tells us that how we evaluate Christians, Christian celebrities, Christian preachers, Christian worship leaders cannot be according to the flesh. How many guys you got coming to your church? How many people downloaded your album? How great is your voice? It's all carnal. It's all flesh. Can you have those things and still be blessed? Absolutely. But sometimes we act just like the world and we get our celebrities just like they do. And some rich, famous person gets saved and we don't say, like we would say to any other Christian disciple, you need to sit down and learn for a while. We say, come speak at our conference. <laughs> would you let any other brand new believer especially one that had been a famous sinner, come and speak to your church? Sometimes we act like, oh, we got one. We got a famous one. We got a beautiful one. We got a talented one. Who cares? Except as a soul has been saved. Meanwhile, somebody else comes into the church that nobody knows or cares about, and they kind of smell, and they're kind of funny, and we're not sure if we want them there. Shame on us. We welcome them all. I've said it over and over again. I don't care if the president himself walks through those doors. He doesn't get treated any differently than anybody else. Now, that either means you've got to keep doing what you're doing or you've got to start treating other people better as if they were the president walking through those doors. Number four, you've got to stop striving. We press on in faith, but you press on only in faith. I've got to secure my salvation. I'm going to start tithing more. Well, okay, that might be a good thing to do. But that's not what's going to save you. But, you're, you're like, but the salvation is so intangible. Yeah. You've got to love and live in the intangibles until it becomes tangible to you. Start prioritizing what actually matters, not just busy work that makes you feel good or look good. Revelation 2, verse 4, Jesus told the church, you've got all kinds of great stuff going for you, but you've left your first love. Therefore, I will remove your lampstand from its place. Number five, here's an easy one. Thank the Lord. Isn't it wonderful to know, Christians, that we've been handpicked by God? Sometimes we get so caught up in the doctrine of it, we miss the fact that Jesus is telling us, I saw you across eternity. I called your name and plucked you out. I said, you will be saved. He did that for you. It applies to you. Salvation is in his hands, not your own. Jude says he is able to make us stand. Thank the Lord, because I need somebody to make me stand. 
Number six, talking about our attitude toward God, walk humbly. Your attitude toward God should be one of humility. You are only here by the grace of God. Don't strut around like you've earned something. Philippians 2.12 says to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Knowing that until the harvest has come, you've got to endure and keep going. You say, well, I don't know if we should talk so much about striving and enduring. You know what Jesus said in Revelation? He said, hold fast what you have until I come. I'm coming quickly. Endure to the end. Walk humbly. Knowing that you were saved and you're in Christ's presence now and you're in his house and you're in his church, but what could be the thing that would tempt you and draw you away from the Lord? Is there anything? Fear it and come to the Lord and say, Jesus, fight for me. And number seven, you must repent and believe. You must be saved. If you know that salvation is in the hands of God and there's not a thing that you can do to earn it, that means that whatever you're piling up to have your list of reasons why God should let you into heaven on that day doesn't mean anything. Well, I've been a pretty good person. Not good enough. Have you been perfect? Well, no, I'm human. Exactly. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Jesus Christ bore your sin on the cross. You can either accept that or say, no thanks, I'll pay it myself. Foolishness. If you've never turned from your sins to follow Jesus in faith, you are destined for hell. John 3, 18 says that if you do not believe, you are condemned already. You must believe. And this is where we're going to leave it today before we go to the communion table. You must repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ today. There's a lot of new faces in here, and I love it. I don't know all your souls, so I'm preaching gospel to you. You must repent and believe on the Lord Jesus today. Do not think to yourself, oh, so God chooses people, so I must be outside of God's elect. He hasn't chosen me, so what's the point of me believing? You cannot possibly know where you stand until that final day. And besides, if you're here, you're hearing me and through me the Holy Spirit calling you to believe. And if you reject that, you'll be just like Pharaoh that said, Moses, get out of my face. When God told you what was up, he's calling you to be saved now. And you Christians who have wandered and fear, when you hear messages like this, what if I've been cast away? What if I'm a tear? I thought I was wheat, but what if I'm not? You too must repent. Don't delay. Don't wait. Don't be afraid that, well, people are going to think that I was rock solid with Jesus, and if I stand up, then it's going to shake everything up. So what? It's before the Lord that you stand or fall, not before me. Return unto the Lord. Your backslidings will have been only backslidings if you come back. But if you persist, it'll become apostasy and rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Great is the mystery of the elect. Salvation is in God's hands. It has nothing to do with the flesh. And we are poor judges of who belongs in and outside the fold of God's flock. But if you have believed on Jesus Christ, you've repented of your sins. You trust him alone for salvation. Then you know in the heart of hearts that you are within the ranks of the saved. The Holy Spirit gives you that joy inexpressible. He seals you with salvation. Do not let the devil rob your joy. I'm not trying to convince anyone they're not saved, but if you're not, you better hear my words. If there's anything that we can do in response to this, it is to dive deeper into the gospel of Jesus Christ.